Hi, my name is Johanna. I'm an LA high school student. Hi, I'm Chelsea. I'm the mate on XC Johnson. Today we're going to be talking about m marine biology. And these are two of the tools that we'll be using. The first one would be a compound scope, generally used for smaller organisms. And this is a, dissec a dissection scope used for bigger organisms, like the ones we have here. We're also going to be using our plankton net because within every teaspoon of seawater, there are millions and millions of plankton floating inside. So plankton, it comes from the Greek word meaning wanderer. They are drifters that float freely in the water. They are defined because they actually cannot swim against a current, they are alive, and they live in the water. So some common examples of plankton are the little copepods, which the plankton in SpongeBob is based off of. Jellyfish are technically plankton. My personal favorite, seahorses, are technically plankton as well because there's no way that tiny little back fin is going to help them swim against a current. Let's break it down into two major categories. We've got our phytoplankton, which are more plant-like in that they photosynthesize, and our zooplankton, which are more animal-like. They are eating the, ph the phytoplankton. They cannot make any food for themselves. Now, phytoplankton are responsible for the majority of the water food chain. They're also responsible for the majority of the oxygen produced on this planet. Everyone take a deep breath. Take another breath. One more for good measure. Two out of three of those breaths are actually thanks to phytoplankton in the water. Not trees on the land, phytoplankton in the water. So marine worms are generally called polychaetes and they're actually very unique because they're the first organisms that actually de develop nerve bundles, meaning they're the first animals to actually have brains as well as develop a digestive tract, meaning they're the first animal to have a mouth and an anus. So they're also the first animal to have hearts and kidneys, which will allow them to not only collect the food that they eat, but also um, spread the nutrients throughout their entire body. Let's talk about echinoderms. They get that fancy name, uh, it means spiny skin, and you've probably seen a lot of echinoderms. They are represented by sea stars, like these little brittle stars we have here, uh, sea urchins, Fun fact, urchin is Old English for hedgehog, so they're sea hedgehogs. It's the cutest thing ever. There also uh, includes sea cucumbers. All of them fall under echinoderms. Now, what makes an echinoderm is they have pentaradial symmetry. That means that they have five planes. You could cut them in five different directions and they would still be symmetrical. You fold them in half, other, one side looks like the other. They have a water vascular system, which means that they don't actually have any blood inside of them. All they have is the water that they are pumping through their body and giving them rigidity. They also have these great little adaptations called tube feet. They look like tiny little suction cups sticking out of their body. So another really big group you'll see in the water is arthropods. That includes things like crabs, lobsters, shrimps, copepods, amphipods, horseshoe crabs, all of that kind of stuff. And they are characterized by their jointed, segmented limbs. They all have the very bendy, hard shells and a, very, a variety of a diet. They range in size from like the big lobsters to even the tiniest little shrimp. Moving on, we've got our mollusk examples here. Common ones you'll see are mussels. You probably like to eat a lot of them, like clams, or like scallops, or oysters. Uh, some oddballs in the mollusk family, well, usually we think about them have, having that nice hard shell, but there are some oddballs out there, like squids and octopus, are actually mollusks as well. Yes, they no longer have a shell, but they do have a mantle, which comes out if you've ever seen the squishy inside of a clam or a mussel. It's the foot 
that is also part of the mantle, which is the squishy part of the octopus, and they have that the same. Tunicates are usually called sea squirts, but they're tunicates. They're actually filter feeders. They take in water from one end, which they filter out for food and oxygen, and through the other end they expel the waste water, which is just CO2 and, well, waste, like us. So <laughs> they're actually the first animal to develop um, nerve cords, which eventually in other animals developed into spinal cords and ultimately into backbones. So in a sense, they're not our relative, but a common ancestor. Thank you for joining us today while we talked about marine invertebrates. And now for your assignment, pick one of these organisms, describe them, and define why they belong to their phylum. My name is Mark Friedman, and I am an educator with the Los Angeles Maritime Institute. I spent 13 years teaching marine biology in inner city Los Angeles, and we have now developed for LAMI a curriculum that correlates to NGSS and Common Core. We are more than happy to share these videos with you and to produce new ones. Our website, www.lamitopsail.org, is filled with activities that you can use in the classroom or online for your students. This includes two complete marine biology courses, one for students taking biology in ninth and 10th grade, and another for juniors and seniors in an honors marine biology course. Both course have extensive materials, lesson plans, reading assignments, homework, games, whatever you may need, labs, in order to fulfill the requirements for teaching biology, AP biology, environmental science, and marine biology. Please visit our website us and contact us if you would like further assistance in developing your course and program.